Hello, everyone. I am Caroline. In the last lesson, we covered the key argument on the side of the Federalists, a faction which had formed due to a major disagreement over a number of different issues regarding the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. Well, just like when working on a class constitution in school, when there are disagreements, both sides of the argument need to be heard in order to find common ground. Today, we will analyze the Anti-Federalists' key arguments and interests. The Anti-Federalists were made up of yeomen, as well as people who had recently settled in new western areas of the U.S. Word alert! We have a new word! Yeoman means small farmers. The key leaders of the Anti-Federalist movement were George Mason, James Winthrop, Patrick Henry, and Melanchthon Smith. This group represented regional industry throughout the states, as opposed to the Federalists, who represented the banking and mercantile interests of the eastern seaboard. The Anti-Federalists were a diverse coalition that included wealthy political elites, as well as different regional economic actors. However, they had one thing in common. Each believed that a strong national government empowered by vague clauses would lead to tyranny. The main premise of their argument was that, because the Constitution enabled corruption, a strong central government could fall into tyranny. They saw that it was possible for the three branches of government to combine in order to destroy the power of the states in a few different ways. One way they saw this happening was by way of the presidential veto. The Anti-Federalists saw these powers as similar to the power of a king being given to the president. Another fear was that the federal courts could threaten the rule of law at the local level. Alert, all ye countrymen, alert to you all! A presidential veto is the power of the president to refuse to approve a bill or joint resolution and thus prevent its enactment into law. The Anti-Federalists were wary of a federal court system empowered by the Supremacy Clause, which declares the federal constitution, federal laws, and federal decisions to be the highest law of the land. The federal court's power to decide on and thus interpret the meaning of the constitution, laws, and decisions of all government in America was seen as a major threat to state and individual liberty. Another saw the House of Representatives' taxation and military powers as potentially leading to abusive taxation with a standing army ready to enforce it. The Elastic Clause, also referred to as the Necessary and Proper Clause, made it possible for the federal government to assume any powers it deemed as necessary and proper to protect and preserve the populace, so long as it did not violate any of the limitations already outlined in the Constitution. They believed this clause gave Congress the ability to assume any powers not listed, which could then lead to oppressive rule. Let's discuss the last two points of disagreement the Anti-Federalists had with the Constitution as it was written. First, they argued that, because Congress was so small, an elite group ruling over such a large area could not possibly be truly in touch with their constituents. And lastly, they argued that the Constitution was in need of a Bill of Rights, a group of amendments outlining specifically the rights of citizens in order to protect individual liberties. Out of this faction came a collection of key essays known as the Anti-Federalist Papers, which were intended to sway public opinion in their favor. The Anti-Federalists raised several key issues through various forms of writing and speeches. The first of these key issues was outlined by George Mason in his work Opposition to a Unitary Executive Power. He argued that too much power given to the president will result in what we just fought against, a king. The Anti-Federalists felt strongly that the president's office had too many powers, such as the veto and appointment, that would allow it to break down the separation of powers and checks and balances that prevent tyranny. In effect, they believed that the Constitution created a system of monarchy disguised as a republic. Alert! Let's learn what one of those words I just said means. 
Appointment, in this context, refers to the ability of the president to appoint members of the executive branch and judges. The second key issue that was raised by anti-federalists in their essays and speeches was centered on the House of Representatives' size and the ability it has to tax and raise an army. The essay, which addresses the executive powers problem we just spoke about as well, was written as a letter to the editor by a source that simply named himself a federal republican. This anonymous writer argues that Congress's power to tax states and raise an army could potentially take money from people and yet leave them still very unprotected, therefore making this power unnecessary and costly. The army could be used to both drain the people of economic resources as well as suppress any dissent or popular uprising. The power to tax by such a small group of people was seen as a clear sign of tyranny. In other words, the federal government is too big, people. Do you really want to give them this much control? Further, an anti-federalist writer, who went by the pseudonym Brutus I, strongly opposed the Elastic Clause. Brutus, who was believed to be a New York delegate present at the Constitutional Convention, spoke to the distrust the Anti-Federalists had for the Elastic Clause, also known as the Necessary and Proper Clause. This clause allows the government to pass any law that helps carry out the other powers granted to Congress. It could, in theory, result in unlimited federal power. Alert! Here we go again! A pseudonym is a fictitious name, especially one used by an author. Ultimately, the Anti-Federalists wanted a Bill of Rights added to the Constitution as it would better limit the federal government and secure freedom. Because the Constitution is the end-all be-all of our legal documents, it is very important not to leave anything up to guessing, especially when it comes to the rights of people. This is why he, as well as the Anti-Federalists, felt it was crucial to create a detailed Bill of Rights covering these specific rights so that there would be no confusion when it came to individual versus state versus federal jurisdiction. Alert again! Ring-a-ding-ding, people! Jurisdiction is the official power to make legal decisions and judgments. So what was the end result of this debate? Ultimately, the main objection to the Constitution as it was written won, and the Bill of Rights was added in order to get it ratified. This was because a number of key states refused to ratify the Constitution as it was, and in 1788, a compromise was struck which allowed for the adding of the Bill of Rights. New Hampshire would be the ninth and last necessary state to ratify it. In fact, all states, except Rhode Island, had ratified the Constitution by 1790, and in that year, Rhode Island did ratify it as well. In 1791, the Bill of Rights was approved, forming the first ten amendments or changes to the Constitution. Recap! Today we discussed how anti-federalists feared a central government with too much power. Wouldn't you? Well, that's it. We hope you enjoyed the lesson today, and thanks for stopping by to learn about the Anti-Federalists. This is Caroline signing off. Have a great day, and remember, vote, debate, and participate.